This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Recently, I saw Donald Trump, regardless of your political opinion of Donald Trump, I think what he said was accurate. But what I saw Donald Trump say was that the Federal Reserve policy was political. In fact, he specifically said interest rates were being kept low to help the president. That may or may not be true. But if you're out there right now and you think that somehow or another, the United States Federal Reserve is apolitical. Well, that's just not accurate. Everything about Washington, D.C. is political. If the Federal Reserve was not political, there would be a systematic process that every last one of us could follow and know their actions at any given time. But of course, it is political. The inputs are political. Everything is political. If there is any subjective part left open to interpretation, it's political. That's the way it works. So you can agree with Trump. You can disagree with Trump. And the administration came out and they said, hey, that's not true. Mr. Trump is wrong. The Federal Reserve is simply doing what's best for the American economy. There you have it. The other side of the coin. Now, what's best for the American economy? That's subjective. What is the American economy? That's subjective. It's all subjective. But we all do know one thing. It's not a good thing when the deficit rings up higher, the debt rings up higher, and interest rates are basically below zero for all intensive purposes. It's not a good thing that an entire generation has been robbed of their savings. There is no more interest income. Now, you might have record levels in the stock market, but you have no income. It's pretty clear that the powers that be felt that after the 2008-2009 crisis, the best way to, quote, recover was to inflate the stock market. And the only tool they had to inflate the stock market was to get interest rates at zero. Well, they've accomplished that goal. Now what? As regular listeners of this podcast know... My particular economic view is less government, less interference. The guests that I've had on my show back that point of view, from Jim Rogers to John Cochran to Mark Faber, the list goes on. Less government, less interference, less playing marionette with the economy. Let the markets find their natural place. Don't try and rig everything. Don't try to engineer everything. But you might say to yourself, Michael, but that's all nonsensical. Who cares? The stock market is at record highs. But twice in the last 15 years, those record highs on the S&P have cratered over 50%. Are you actually sitting there right now and you think the government, the current administration, the future administration, the Federal Reserve, do you think those people can really stop the S&P cratering another 50% when it does, in fact, do that, and it will? Now, of course, I can't give you the timing. I can't give you the prediction. That's not the way the world works. But we all know it will come. We don't know exactly how. We don't know what will happen. But it will arrive, and it will surprise, and it will shock Not everybody, for example, like many of the guests I've had on my show, many of these people that have these very libertarian economic views, they'll say, hey, we told you what the government was doing, what the Fed was doing would lead to imbalances. A bubble would develop and a bubble would pop. So many people, including myself, will not be surprised when it happens. That's the natural order. That's the way it goes. It's booms and busts, booms and busts. My guest today shares many of those views. Jim Rickards has had a terribly interesting career. He was general counsel for the hedge fund Long-Term Capital Management. He was the principal negotiator in the 1998 bailout of LTCM by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Jim has had a catbird seat 
to some of the most interesting events of the last 15 to 20 years. What I've always found interesting about the hedge fund long-term capital management was when it went bust, there was winners, there were losers. Long-term capital management was the loser, but there were winners in this great zero-sum game. Trend-following traders, for example, were the big winners when long-term capital went under. Now, that's one positive story that I can spin from my perspective and my vantage point on that crisis at that point in time. And as Jim will talk about today, there were many things that came out of that particular incident of history that were not very good. Because what we really did in the summer of 1998 was we laid the foundation for unlimited bailouts. Anybody and everybody could get bailed out. And basically, after long-term capital management, the Fed, the powers that be, said, game on, lever up, do whatever the hell you want to do. And of course, that led within a decade right into the crisis of 07, 08, 09. Since long-term capital management, Jim has written several books, bestsellers, currency wars, the most recent one, The Death of Money. Whether you agree with Jim or not, and I'm not really sure how you can disagree, but let's say you disagree. At least listen. Listen to what he brings up. None of us can predict tomorrow. None of us can say this will happen, that will happen. But damn it, when the system is rigged, when the system is played, there's trouble always ahead. That much you can guarantee. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Jim Rickards. So Jim, I'm about f a 45 minute flight right now as we talk from Bangkok. In Bangkok, what happened in Bangkok, what happened in Thailand in 1997 and what continued to happen into 1998, specifically August and September, but Thailand, 1997, that changed your life, didn't it? Well, it uh, was the beginning of something that changed my life very significantly, although it took a little while to play out. What we're referring to, Michael, is that in uh, really actually in May of 1997, a little more accentuated in June, the Central Bank of Thailand devalued their currency, the Thai baht. Now, what had been going on prior to that is that they had been ma maintaining a peg of the Thai baht to the U.S. dollar. But their interest rates and returns were higher than um, the cost in U.S. dollars. So there was the classic carry trade. U.S. investors were borrowing dollars at a lower rate, converting to Thai baht, going into Thailand, buying, you know, you name it, commercial real estate, golf courses, resorts, stocks, bonds, whatever it was in Thailand. Island uh, with very high returns and they were leveraging it and they were making very, very good returns on their equity. But it was all based on the assumption that the Thai bot would stay fixed to the U.S. dollar so that whenever you wanted out, you could just sell your asset, get back to dollars, unwind the trade and keep the profits and live happily ever after. And by the way, that kind of carry trade was going on all over the world in uh, Indonesia, Korea and elsewhere. So what happened was that there was a, a sort of a panic. People said, hey, I think I'll get my money out this thing looks bubbly, I'll get out while the getting's good. Uh, they start to lose reserves and the Thai, the Thai central bank said, we can't maintain this peg. We can't keep cashing out these Thai bots for US dollars at this level. So we're going to break the peg and extremely devalue the currency, which they did. Well, that just started a bigger panic because people realized, well, gee, not only is the end coming, the end is actually here. But then they looked around at the rest of the landscape, Malaysia, Indonesia, Korea, some of the countries I mentioned and others, and said, well, maybe the same thing can happen there. So this became a more globalized a general panic going into the summer, early fall of 1997. I was actually in Hong Kong in September 1997 at the IMF annual meeting when there was a showdown of sorts between Mohammed Mahathir, who was the Prime Minister of Malaysia, and the uh, 
uh, and George Soros, of course, a uh, very well-known investor, where it was it was a shouting match, name-calling. Uh, Soros was saying Mahathir was crazy. Uh, Mahathir was accusing Soros of uh, undermining emerging markets. Uh, Bob Rubin was the Secretary of the Treasury at the time. He was there. They tried to kind of break up the fight a little bit. Because what Mahathir did, because now we're talking Malaysia, not Thailand, but Mahathir actually put on exchange controls. He said, this run on the bank, these valuations make no sense. This is really, you know, just banks in New York and hedge funds playing games. Why should I go along with that? He threw on capital controls. That's why he was uh, ridiculed by Soros. But but actually, to his credit, Soros recently has said, you know, Mahathir was right. Uh, these things don't make sense. Uh, they feed on themselves, and maybe there's a place for capital controls. This panic became more general. It went around the world. You know, we often hear the expression blood in the streets. You know, we say when markets are really going down, you know, look out for blood in the streets. Well, sadly, there was real blood in the streets. There were riots in Jakarta, Indonesia, Seoul, Korea. People were killed. Uh, the riot police were brought out. And uh, this raged on throughout the fall of 97. There was a little bit of a calm period in kind of January 1998, January to April 1998, the early part of that year. By the way, this whole time this is going on, I'm describing this chronology, I was the uh, general counsel and a partner at long-term capital management funds. Uh, we had um, uh, two Nobel Prize winners uh, on our uh, management committee among our partners, uh, Myron Scholes uh, and Robert Merton, who were the uh, co discovers, if you will, the famous Black-Scholes formula along with uh, Fisher Black, who had uh, passed away at the time, but they won the Nobel Prize for that in 1997. So we had a raft of PhDs and folks from MIT and University of Chicago, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you know, Wharton, the biggest brains uh, in finance working for us. Well, they were looking at Asia in the spring of 1998. Now, this is now four or five months after, uh, six months rather, after this class began, looking for opportunities. They say, hey, these markets are so beaten down, we can kind of come in and scoop up some of the pieces. And I was working on an Asia fund with uh, some other um, investors at the time, trying to put uh, our money together with theirs, because it didn't stop in Southeast Asia. Next went to Russia, and by June, July of the, the summer of 98, uh, Russia was in distress. Finally, in August, the whole system just broke down completely. Russia was another one of these emerging markets, which had had huge capital inflows, uh, you know, based on growth prospects and belief in a peg to the dollar. Well, Russia um, not only broke the peg, but they defaulted on all of their government obligations. They unpegged their currency. Their currency crashed. Their bonds crashed. They not only defaulted on their external debt, uh, which is you know you can understand if it's denominated in dollars. They defaulted on their internal debt in rubles. They said, gee, why would you do that? You can always print the rubles. Uh, but they did it anyway. So this led to a general global financial panic, uh, as bad in its way as, uh, as what happened in 2008. And the hedge fund I worked at, long-term capital management, got caught in the crossfire. We lost four billion dollars in one month uh, from about mid-August to mid-September. But what was not well known was that people say, hey, it's a hedge fund, but a bunch of rich guys in Greenwich, who cares? You know, you lose your money, why should we care? Well, the reason people cared, or at least the Federal Reserve cared, was that we had uh, over $1 trillion of derivatives contracts with all the Wall Street banks. In other words, if we went out of business, uh, I used to say, oh, oh, I could sleep in the next day. I mean, we filed for bankruptcy, I could stay home and sleep in the next day. But all of those trillion dollars of derivatives were going to go back to the Wall Street banks. And it was the big losers. We, we, could, we couldn't lose more than 100% of our capital. The ex ex expanded balance sheet, the derivatives were all with the Wall Street firms, they would have lost the trillion dollars. That would have clearly taken down Lehman, probably uh, would have cascaded into uh, an even worse crisis than we had in 2008. That's when the Fed intervened. I spent a whole day with uh, Federal Reserve officials and Treasury officials locked in a room with our CEO, John Merriweather, and a couple others, and we went through the books, and that's when the Fed uh, organized a bailout, and the bailout was done. We negotiated the letter last week of September, and by uh, September 29th, which happened to be my birthday, by the way, we, we got that done, and um, uh, they put in $4 billion. They, by the way, they didn't bail us out. That money was lost. They bailed themselves out by taking over the balance sheet and propping up the books so they didn't have to bear all the losses that would have happened if we had actually filed for bankruptcy. Let me interject one thing, Jim. So at that moment in time, because it there's been some great writing about the the subject and what what happened and you're you know you got a bird's eye view of everything 
And I've seen you quoted saying this. You said, basically, the officials looked at LTCM's failure and said, quote, the game's on. You can do whatever you want with as much leverage as you want and with as much opaqueness as you want, end quote. What happened in the summer of 1998? That didn't just leave us. I mean, that set in motion the next decade. And to this day, 17, 18 years later, we're still living it. Well, I agree with that. It, it's not quite the case that any government official came out and said, game on. But if you were reading between the lines, that would be the takeaway. In other words, what were the lessons of long-term capital management? What were the lessons of 1998? Well, the lessons were derivatives are dangerous, leverage is dangerous, and getting banks involved is dangerous. Those were the three lessons. What was government policy over the next uh, two years? Uh, in other words, now we're talking about 1998 19, and 2000 and, and early into the 21st century. Well, the first thing they did, they repealed Glass-Steagall in 1999. This allowed the banks to act like hedge funds. Then in 2000, they rewrote the commodities law so that you could do swaps, which are basically non-regulated futures. Anyone knows anything about swap agreements? They're, they're just futures contracts without the futures exchanges, without the regulation, without the margin. So they uh, rewrote the futures law so you could do swaps on everything. And then a few years later, actually in 2006, uh, the SEC took away the leverage requirement on broker-dealers. They said the banks could act like hedge funds. They said you could have unlimited leverage in the swap market, uh, completely unregulated. And then they said, oh, broker-dealers, you can have, uh, we can double your leverage too from 15 to 1 to 30 to 1. In other words, public policy was the exact opposite of what they should have learned from long-term capital management. Long again, long-term capital management would have taught you derivatives are dangerous, leverage is dangerous, banks need to be closely regulated. Instead, they deregulated the banks, allowed uh, as much leverage as you want in any product you want, and then allowed the broker-dealers to get in on the accident. They did the opposite. So I was going around giving speeches in 2005, 2006, having lived through 1998. I, I not only had a front row seat, I mean, I, I negotiated the bailout. I was the one who actually, you know, sat with the CEOs of the 14, what we call the 14 families, the big Wall Street firms, the people at the time. I mean, some of them have moved on, some of them have passed away, but, you know, this is... Uh, uh, you know, John Corzine and and uh, John Thane and David Kamans, get Merrill Lynch and Herb Allison and, uh, you know, the Jimmy Kane from Bear Stearns. I mean, all the names that kind of came to the fore later, they were all in the room uh, when we did this deal. So probably nobody knew more about what went wrong than I did. And we brought that plane in for a soft landing from the runways. I mean, you know, I say soft landing it was pretty horrific, but at the at the end of the day, look what happened. Uh, NASDAQ, uh, Dow Jones, all the stock indices, they went to all-time highs after that crisis. And by the way, the Fed cut interest rates. Now, we were sitting there in Greenwich in, in our conference room losing, you know, $100 million, $200 million a day. The, the thing with $4 billion, it take, even, even when you're losing $100 million a day, it takes a, it takes a month to run out of money. <laughs> but we were seeing it happen. And we, what we wanted was for the Fed to cut interest rates. We said, hey, if the Fed cut interest rates, that'll restore confidence. These spreads that have widened will start to come in. We'll make the money back. You know, life will go. Well, the Fed didn't cut interest rates rates until Wall Street took over our balance sheet. In other words, they were not doing us any favors. We were a hedge fund. But once Wall Street took over the balance sheet, the Fed cut rates. Uh, that was at a regularly scheduled meeting at the end of September, at the, September, uh, September 29th. Now, what happened next was interesting because it, that rate cut did not end the panic. LTCM, with the new owners, with the new Wall Street owners, lost another $500 million dollars after the Fed cut rates, after the bailout, that, that part of the story is, I think that's completely unknown, that the panic was not over. All of a sudden, we weren't losing our own money anymore. Wall Street was losing its money, another $500 million. So the Fed, this is Alan Greenspan's Fed, in early October, convened an emergency meeting. This was not a scheduled FOMC meeting. This was not on anybody's calendar. And they had the authority to do this. They convert and convened an emergency meeting, and they cut rates a second time. That did the trick. That said to Wall Street. Street. Hey, well, as Mario Draghi said in 2012, whatever it takes, right? The message to Wall Street was, we'll cut. If they keep losing money, we'll cut more. We'll keep cutting until this panic is over. So then Wall Street said, okay, you're serious. And, and then the panic was over. By the way, that was the last time that the Fed acted 
on an emergency basis. Uh, everything that's happened since then, including 2008, these were scheduled meetings, uh, at least in terms of FOMC policy. Uh, that was the last time they did an intra meeting policy action was in uh, early October 1998. But the point is, uh, instead of learning the lesson, they did the opposite. So I'm sitting there watching it, saying, okay, I know what happened. I know what went wrong. I know what they should do. They're doing the opposite. Therefore, this is going to happen again. So I was warning, and uh, you know, I, I was I didn't quite have the um, uh, the other you know, television time and and the books uh, I have today. I was lecturing at universities. I was lecturing and meeting you know the U.S. government, doing various uh, consulting uh, engagements, and I told everyone who would listen that this was going to happen again. And sure enough, it did in in 2008. It was highly predictable. So now, fast forward to 2008. What happened? Well, again, they bailed everybody out. They printed money. They did, uh, you know, not just the four trillion dollars that the Fed printed on their balance sheet, but tens of trillions of dollars of swap lines with the European Central Bank, trillions of dollars of subsidies to the banking industry in the form of uh, zero interest rates. I mean. Bank deposit rates, that's the cost of money for a bank. In other words, any business, you've got expenses and revenues, right? That's how you make money in any business. Well, what are the expenses of a bank? Well, they're interest costs. What's the interest cost? Zero. In other words, the Fed is subsidizing the bank. It's screwing the savers. We say, who loses in that? It's people working hard, saving their money, putting their money in the bank, looking for some kind of return. They're getting zero. So they're the ones whose money is being stolen that's being handed over to the bankers in the form of zero cost of funds, which the bankers can then go out and lend at a positive return, leverage it up, make very good returns on equity, enrich themselves, pay big bonuses to themselves, all at the expense of everyday Americans. So that's, our, that's how corrupt the system is today. Why would you expect it otherwise? I mean, the mess, the lesson of 1998 and government policy in the years after was exactly as you said, Mike, which is anything goes. We're going we're gonna to bail out the big guys. We're going to manipulate the system. We're going to do what it takes and go out and leverage it up. So now, so then, come forward to 2008, we have another financial panic. Uh, you know, rates were too low for too long under Greenspan from 02 to 06. Uh, the mortgage market cracked, another generalized panic, another wave of bailouts. Uh, and here we are in 2015, almost uh, not too far away from 2016, you know, seven years after the uh, last panic. And guess what? We're doing it again. You know, uh, the stock market is being propped up, uh, uh, markets being manipulated, money's being printed, not just by the Fed. You can blame the Fed, but uh, People's Bank of China, Bank of Japan, Bank of England. Before you go into the wider currency actions of today. I want to go back a little bit and stay where you were at for a moment. Anybody can go back right now and they can look at the comments of Bernanke, 05, 06, 07. And he's just on the record everywhere. There's no problem. Real estate's never gone down. Da, 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 da. I mean, everyone's seeing these comments. What's so amazing, and I guess it's kind of a two-part I'll let you run with, but what's so amazing is the very people that say the, the, the quote, public policy people, the very people that said years before the crisis that there was no problem, almost up to the moment that it happened, were the very same people after that were making the decisions to supposedly fix everything. I want you to comment on that. But number two, I'd like you to comment on in the fall of 2008. And I don't say this in any kind of a derogatory type way, but I think one of the most interesting stories about the fall of 2008 was America's most famous investor. Because, you know, it seemed like America's most famous investor in Omaha was getting these sweetheart deals. And, he, you know, he had this massive position in banks. And look, hey, you know, it's great to be Warren Buffett. But, you know, it just seemed like so many pieces of that puzzle that happened in 06, 07, even the fall of 08. It just doesn't seem like we still know the full story about who was pulling what strings. It just seems so, so hidden still. So, so what you're saying, Michael, is you know the the policymakers come out and uh, they get it wrong every time. They don't see the bubbles. They don't see the crashes. They tell you things are okay when they're not okay. Their forecasts are awful, and certain people seem you know the rich get richer and everyone else gets left behind. So those are all facts, and I agree with that recitation of facts. And so then you have to draw one of two conclusions: Is this some deep dark conspiracy? to screw the little guy and enrich uh, you know, a small elite? Or are they just 
uh, completely wrong, completely obsolete. Uh, in other words, they're they're trying the best they can, and it's not actually a conspiracy, but they're just unbelievably incompetent at what they do. I lean to the latter. I have a lot of points of contact with the U.S. government. I've done a lot of consulting for uh, the Defense Department, the intelligence community. I've met with the Treasury. I've met with the Fed. I'm inside the room a lot. I met with the uh, Financial Stability Oversight Committee, which is the uh, that's, that's some call, sometimes called the Plunge Protection Team. You know, this is the successor to the old President's Working Group that was formed after the um, crash in um, uh, 1987. I met with Fed governors. I've met with Reserve Bank presidents. I've met with Fed staffers. You know, and the, and like in private dinners. I'm not talking about big speeches, but a lot of one-on-one conversations. So my points of contact are pretty extensive. And uh, if you knew how in Competent our government is, you'd sort of put the conspiracy theories to one side. They're not, they can't even organize things when they're trying to do things right, let alone run a deep conspiracy. I lean to the second conclusion, which is they actually don't know what they're doing. They're trying hard. They're, 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 they might be dealing in good faith. They are intelligent. I mean, they would score way ahead of me in an IQ test, so there's not too much doubt about that. But IQ points are not enough, and uh, trying hard is not enough. If you have the wrong models, you will get the wrong results every time. If you have obsolete tools, you will get the wrong forecasts every time. And that's what I see happening, which is that they've got models, uh, financial models and, and risk management models that do not correspond to the real world, that do not accurately, not even close to accurately describe how capital markets actually work. And that's what I've spent the last, really, uh, at this point, the 17 years doing. Uh, you know, I was a lawyer, and I was surrounded by PhDs and Nobel Prize winners, and I said, gee, I'm not as smart as you guys. If you think this is okay, it must be okay. I made a lot of money uh, at the time. I brought a lot of money to the table, and I put almost all of it into long-term capital management in the belief that these guys know what they knew what they were doing, and I lost almost all of it, uh, 90, uh, 92%, in fact. I came out of that, and I felt, well, gee, I did my job. You know, uh, legally, nothing happened. There were no lawsuits. There were no enforcement actions. Nobody, you know, got sued. Uh, nobody lost any money. Everybody went back to business. In fact, the people at long-term capital, have many of them have made billions of dollars since then. Uh, a lot of the principals in the back office started a company called Globe Op, which was a hedge fund administrator, sold for close to a billion dollars. One of our traders is probably going to be the next CEO of J.P. Morgan after Jamie Dimon. Uh, there's a guy named Matty Zames. Matt was one of our kind of you know junior traders on the floor. He's done very well. Lots of success stories come because we had a lot of talent. That's not really surprising. Imagine losing $4 billion in a month and everybody walking away without a scratch. Well, that was what I did as the lawyer. Uh, I handled the all, you know, all the inquiries, the investigations, the hearings, the negotiation. I did all that. So I said, "Well, gee, I did my job, but but you guys kind of didn't do your job. You were the you were the traders and the portfolio managers and the risk managers, and I lost all this money. And I know you're smart because I, you know, I shared an office with Myron Scholes, you know, and he was very generous with his time. He taught me a lot about options. But the point being, uh, I said these models." cannot possibly be right. If they were right, we, we, this couldn't have happened. Uh, but it did happen. So instead of saying it was, you know, some, uh, what do people say, uh, you know, the, the thousand year storm or once in every three billion dollar years, all that statistical nonsense. I said, no, uh, that's not what happened. What happened is your models are wrong. So I said about uh, studying uh, the dynamics of capital markets on my own. I took some uh, university courses, but I did a lot of it on my own. But I studied physics, network theory, graph theory, complexity theory, uh, various branches of physical sciences, physics, uh, applied mathematics, and, and other branches of science, and began taking that learning and applying it to capital markets, which is completely different from what the Fed does. The Fed's using uh, what they call uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. Um, they have other, uh, they, they assume that risk is normally distributed. They assume uh, trends are mean reverting. They assume a lot of things that are just false, I mean, empirically false. It's not a matter of opinion. You can actually look at studies of how prices work in capital markets, and they do not correspond to uh, what I just described, what I just attributed to the Fed. But what I discovered was that the models I was using, specifically you know, recursive functions uh, and complexity theory, actually worked pretty well. Uh, I was starting to get good results. So it was then I started you know, writing my books and more recently uh, my newsletter, Strategic Intelligence, doing more lectures, doing more advisory work. Uh, you know, kind of holding myself out publicly in, in interviews like this. 
You were talking about the models, the Fed having the wrong models. The right models really are rooted in much of the behavioral work, aren't they? I mean, that's that's the right type of thinking is in the behavioral work. And I'm imagining that the behavioral thinking from the likes of a Kahneman and a Vernon Smith, you don't see that type of thinking behind the scenes, even at LTCM or the Fed, do you? That's not the kinds of conversations and the thought processes that would have existed with those groups of people. Would that be correct? It's correct that they were not using behavioral uh, economics. They were not the models that came out of the experiments of Kahneman and Tversky in the 1970s and 1980s. That that was not being used. So you're right about that. But I would um, disagree a little bit in terms of what I do. I actually have three separate branches of science, none of which are conventional financial theory. So behavioral science. Absolutely. It's very powerful stuff. It completely refutes most of the pillars of modern financial theory. Those pillars are based on things like the efficient market hypothesis, you know, value at risk, normally distributed risk, uh, rational expectations. Those are all the things that people at the Fed use to uh, make their forecasts. And the rug was pulled out from under all that by uh, Daniel Kahneman and, and uh, Tversky and, and their associates. And that is something that uh, behavioral economics has shone a light on, and I do use it, so I, I completely agree with that. But there are two other branches I use. One is complexity theory. Kahneman was not a complexity theorist. Uh, there are plenty of complexity theorists around, but they're all at the uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, two places where I have lectured and I have uh, met with people there. Santa Fe Institute is a nice, uh, very high quality uh, unit inside the London School of Economics. So this sort of thing is going on. It's not mainstream at all. I guarantee it's not being used by the Fed because I talk to people at the Fed and I ask them about this and they have no idea what I'm talking about. When you say complexity theory, define that for the audience. Complexity theory has uh, a lot of you know, a lot of substance, but the main the main thing I say two things come out of it. Number one, there's the idea of the emergent property. The emergent property is the event that comes out of the complexity system itself, but it cannot be inferred from perfect knowledge of the system. And, and by the way, this is just an up-to-date 21st century physics-based version of what uh, Friedrich von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises had always said, which is that you know central planning works fine if you had a central planner who knew everything, but since there is no such person, central planning doesn't work. Complexity theory takes that a step further. I, I like to I get into debates with uh, Austrian economists, and I've studied Austrian economics, and I think highly of it. But I say, you know, if Mises were alive today, he wouldn't be an Austrian; he'd be a complexity theorist. Because, so, so what the Austrians say is that with perfect knowledge, you might be able to essentially plan an economy, but nobody has perfect knowledge, so therefore it doesn't work. And I agree with that. But complexity theory says even if you had perfect knowledge you still couldn't predict it because emergent properties come seemingly out of nowhere. So you're in the middle of the um, eastern Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Africa. It's a sunny day and all of a sudden it gets cloudy and all of a sudden you know the wind shifts and all of a sudden it hits some warm water and, and next thing you know you have a hurricane and the hurricane gets to New Orleans and destroys the city, right? So where did that hurricane come from? There was nothing about the sunny day that would have predicted it. That's a that's a, an example of complexity theory. It's the thing that comes seemingly out of nowhere. You, you know it after the fact. Yeah, yeah everyone knows it was a hurricane. Uh, Hurricane Katrina hits New Orleans in 2005. We get that. What was it about the sunny day in Africa that would tell you, oh, here comes the hurricane? The answer is nothing. It, it's, it's, it's that, but that's what a financial panic is. Financial panic seemed to come out of nowhere. And, and complexity theory has four main pillars, if you will, four things that kind of sum up what complexity theory is. The first one is diversity of actors. In other words, you need take all the, the actors or uh, the, the, uh, the units in the system. It can be a natural system, like a forest fire. It can be a man-made system, like stock markets. But whatever the system is, you, you've got diverse actors, right? Because So do we have that in capital markets? Sure. You've got bulls and bears, longs and short, fear and greed, leverage, non-leverage. Right? If we all thought the same thing, it would, nothing interesting would happen, right? But it's because we all think different things. So you, you, you sort of check the diversity box. Uh, the second one is connectedness. Okay, so we all have different points of view, but are we connected in some ways? You know, 50 cavemen could have 50 different opinions, but if they're, if they're not connected, nothing interesting happens. Well, are we connected? Of course we are. Uh, we've got 
you know, Dow Jones, Reuters, Bloomberg, you know, Insta Instagram, uh, CNBC, uh, telephones, iChat, uh, email, uh, you know, podcasts. We were probably too connected. We're massively connected. Uh, the third thing is interaction. Okay, so we're, we got diverse opinions. We're connected. Are we interacting? Are we doing stuff? Well, the answer is, of course, we are. Trillions of dollars of stocks, bonds, commodities, currency, transactions every single day. And the fourth one, and this is the hardest for people to understand, is adaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior just means that your behavior affects my behavior and my behavior affects your behavior and vice versa. And so um, a simple example, you're in your apartment in New York. You're looking outside, you don't know what the weather is like, and uh, you're trying to decide what to wear, and you look, and everyone walking down the street has got a big down jacket, a big uh, woolly hat, and a big thick pair of mittens on. Well, you're probably not going to go outside in a t-shirt. You know, as your behavior is going to adapt to what you're seeing around you, you're probably going to put a nice warm jacket on and a hat. But applied to capital markets, this is sometimes called herding, you know, et cetera. So that's, so that's what complexity theory teaches us, and you get into recursive Functions. A recursive function is just a fancy name for a feedback loop. A small number of people start, you know, again, another very simple example. Let's say you have a room full of 100 people, and I'm standing up in front of the room giving a speech, and two people get up and run out of the room. What do the rest of them do? Well, they probably just sit there. I'm sure they think those two people are weird, maybe rude. They got a message. I'm running, Jim. I'm running problems. out of the room. <laughs> well, you you have a low, well, you have a low critical threshold. Like I can sort of give you the master class, but that's called your th critical threshold. Most people are going to sit there if two people run out of the room. But what if 50 people run out of the room? I dare say the other 50 are going to be right behind them. They're going to say, hey, we don't know what's going on. Maybe the place is on fire. Maybe there's a bomb. Who knows what? We're out of here. Just to put it in mathematical space, for those people, their critical threshold is greater than two, less than 50. You can express it as, a, as, a, as an inequality. And then, but the point is it's adaptive behavior. You, you have a response function to what other people are doing. But the point is it varies. Some days you're going to be bold. You're going to sit there. You'll be the last guy out of the room. Other days you're going to be timid. You'll be, the free, you'll be running out with Two people run out. Everyone has different critical thresholds. The critical thresholds change all the time. Well, imagine not. Uh, no, so if you were trying to predict when does everybody run out of the room, is it two? Probably not. Is it fifty? Almost definitely. Was well, it twenty? Is it thirty? You know, what is that tipping point where at some point everyone else's reaction function makes them run out of the room too? Well, I just gave you an illustration where it's greater than two, less than fifty, but. Is it 30? Is it 20? Is it 40? That makes a big difference. That's how close we are to complete and utter collapse of capital markets. So that's an example of uh, adaptive behavior. So take these four things, diversity of players, connectedness, interaction, and adaptive behavior. This is what creates financial panics. This is what causes stock markets to come down. And I promise you, because I know firsthand, these are not the models that the Fed uses. They use, uh, they use equilibrium models, which assume that when things get out of whack, they can apply policy and bring it back into whack, almost like winding up a clock that ran down. It's not how the world works. So I mentioned two of the things I use. One is behavioral economics, which is Kahneman, which you talked about. One is complexity theory, which I just described. Uh, the third branch is inverse probability. Uh, I don't know if your listeners saw a movie called The Imitation Game. It was out uh, last summer. It was about the effort to crack the Enigma code, which the uh, German Navy was using to communicate with their U-boats at the beginning of World War II. They were sinking enormous amounts of Allied shipping, and, but they had to tell the submarines what to do. You know, the Naval Command had to tell the submarines where to go and give them orders, uh, but they knew that message traffic, that radio traffic, could be in so they needed an encryption system so they could give orders without the British understanding. Well, the British set about basically hiring, the, in, the, recruiting the biggest brains. Again, who were they? They were physicists. They were mathematicians. They were not... You know, they were not soldiers and they were not people from financial markets. They were people with this kind of uh, physics mathematics training that I'm describing to essentially invent the first computer and crack the code, which they did. What they used was um, inverse probability. Um, and basically, and I use this, uh, you know, I gave an interview on CNBC in November 2014. Now, remember, this is almost a year ago, November 2014. I said categorically, the Fed will not raise interest rates in 2015. Now, at the time, what was Wall Street saying? Wall Street was saying March, and then they got to March, and they said June, and then they got to June, and they said September, and then they got to September, and now they're saying December. They were wrong the entire year, and I was right. 
over a year ago. Well, how did I do that? Well, I was using this method that I'm describing, which is, uh, it's got a couple of names, inverse probability, uh, causal inference, or uh, Bayes' theorem. They're all the same. But what you do is you form, it's when you don't have enough information. Look, if we had enough information to make decisions, life would be easy, right? We'd have plenty of information. We wouldn't have to use any other methodology. How do you solve problems when you don't have enough information? How do you solve problems when the clues are very sketchy? Uh, these are the problems we get in the intelligence community. You have to stop the next 9-11 attack, but you know nothing about the whereabouts uh, and uh, the actions and the activities of your uh, terrorist opponents. How do you solve that problem? Same thing in capital markets. So what you do, one, one technique, is to form an a priori hypothesis using the best information you have. You know it's imperfect. You know it's, you know, the, the, the big brains like Janet Yellen, they would say, no, give me, you know, give me a five million data points and I'll do a regression and I'll do correlations and covariance matrix and I'll tell you what's going to happen next. Sorry, Janet, we don't have time for five million terrorist attacks. We'll be dead as a nation before we get there. We only have one, which is 9-11, and, and that's our, our reference point. How do we solve that problem? So this is what you use when you don't have enough data. Uh, but then once you form your hypothesis, you then test it by subsequent events, what we call indications and warnings. And this is why it's called inverse probability, because you're working backwards, right? You're working backwards from the subsequent data to test the validity of the initial hypothesis, which is the exact opposite of what Janet Yellen does. Janet Yellen says, give me all the data, and I'll give you a hypothesis. But we're saying we don't have the data. We have to have a hypothesis because we have to decide what to do tomorrow. Uh, but we're going to test it with subsequent data. So that's why it's inverse probability. And I could see that uh, the Fed was basing their – they were saying they were going to hike rates. There's no question they said that. The market believed them. But why did they say it? Well, they said it because they had a forecast which would indicate you should raise rates. But what I knew that apparently Wall Street missed was that the Fed has the worst forecasting record in the world. The Fed had been wrong six years in a row. Look, go back and look at the Fed forecast in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. They were wrong six years in a row. So I, my inference was, well, they're probably wrong again. Why would they be wrong six years in a row when all of a sudden they get it right? They're probably wrong again because they're using the wrong models. So if they think the economy is going to get strong enough to raise rates, it's probably not going to be strong enough to raise rates. Therefore, they won't raise rates. And that was the basis of my forecast. And then I just tested it throughout the year. And here we are. You know, the, what you just described is interesting. I've had a guest on my show, a professor out of Greece named Spiros Makrodakis. And he's famous for basically saying a simple moving average generally beats all of these complicated econometric models. They simply just don't work. You know, the proof's in the pudding. And it's it's amazing. And you, what you just really described is like, look, all this complicated data that you have doesn't give us tomorrow. There's a better way for us to get in alignment with what might happen tomorrow than trying to crunch whatever the Fed is crunching. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. The, the assessment that what the policymakers are using does not work is absolutely correct. Professor, you referred to saying, okay, well, if that doesn't work, maybe something else works better is also absolutely correct. So then the only issue is, okay, well, what what is it who works better? And I applaud anyone who's trying to, to do this. I, it's something I spent, as I say, 17 years doing, and I have found some things that do work better. There may be others that who have found things that work well, too. And again, I applaud that. The, the, more, the more learning, the more science, the more information we can get, the better. But let's not be stuck with these old models that clearly do not work. And it's not just opinion. I mean, empirically, they don't work. Just look at the results. What I would love for you to talk about a little bit here, and it's something you've become known for in the last few years, is this notion of currency wars. And I think it would be very useful for the audience for you to describe some of the actors. Of course, the main actors we all know. we got the United States of America. We have China. We have Russia. Describe some of these actors and what's going on behind the scenes. Because hey, even like the other day, I, I'm calling you from Saigon today. You know, uh, let's say three years ago, uh, a million dong was $50. Today, a million dong is uh, $44. China just cut their rates again. So you know what's going to happen with all these currencies. So there's definitely a battle going on, as you, as you call it, a war of currency. Why don't you describe that war and some of the actors and what the motivations are and what everyone's trying to get to? Because if everyone is in a race to the bottom, it's not a good thing, is it? 
That's right. And this is, of course, the subject of my first book, Currency Wars. My more recent book, The Death of Money, uh, came out in 2014. talks a lot about the international monetary system and the future of the system. But my first book, uh, Currency Wars, came out in 2011, which, by the way, is still very fresh. If you pick it up and read it today, if listeners haven't read it, it's it's not stale at all. It actually talks about Ukraine and Russia and natural gas and uh, SDRs and a lot of other things that are very topical today. So, uh, it's, it's had a pretty uh, pretty robust shelf life. But a currency war, uh, they don't always happen. Uh, we're not always in a currency war. But when we are, they can last for 10 or 15 years. And that's what I point out in my book. So when I wrote the book in 2011, you know, and I've had people call me recently. And they say, hey, Jim, you know, it's 2015. We're in a currency war. How did you know in 2011 that we were going to be in a currency war in 2015? And my answer is, it's the same currency war. It started in 2010. My book came out in 2011. But I'm not the least bit surprised that it's still going on in 2015. I think it'll be going on in 2020 if the system doesn't collapse before then, which it might. The point is, they don't have a logical conclusion. They just go back and forth and back and forth. So what it, they happen when there's not enough growth in the world and too much debt. You have too much debt, not enough growth. Very simple condition to understand. Why, why does that matter? Well, you need growth to pay off the debt, right? If you don't have the growth, you're not going to pay off the debt. The debt's going to go into default. The banking system will be destroyed and the economy will be in a depression. So that's why you need the growth. So, okay, what do you do when you've got too much debt, not enough growth? How do you pay off the debt then? Well, the answer is inflation. Well, how do you get the inflation? Well, cut rates. What happens when you get to zero? Now what do you do? Hmm. Well, the answer is cheapen your currency. You can always import inflation. So this is the genesis of the currency wars. It's a, it's a desperate struggle. And all that's happening is that people are stealing growth from each other. So let me just kind of take you through the sequence, Michael. Who had the cheap currency in 2009? It was China. Remember Secretary Geithner threat talking about currency manipulation? They were going to treasury was going to name them a currency manipulator, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, flash forward to 2011. Who had the cheap currency then? That was the dollar. And Bernanke gave a speech in Tokyo in 2012 explaining the cheap dollar. He said, look, we're the biggest economy in the world. If we go down, we take the rest of you with us. So you have to let us have the cheap dollar. Okay, now come forward to 2013. Who had the cheap currency then? It was the yen. That was Abenomics. That was one of the five hours of uh, uh, Abenomics was to uh, to cheapen the yen. Uh, sorry, the three hours of Abenomics uh, was to cheapen the yen. So they got the cheap yen. Well, who's suffering the whole, the whole time, right? You have the cheap yuan in China, the cheap dollar, and the cheap yen. Well, who's suffering? Europe. It was the strong euro the whole time. And, and in 2012, 2013, 2014, when, you know, Stiglitz and Krugman and uh, Rubini and all these guys were running around with the hair on fire saying, Grexit, uh, you know, the euro is going to collapse, people are going to leave, Spain should quit the euro, go back to the Peseta, devalue the currency. I was the one who said no. Europe's sticking together. Nobody's getting kicked out. Nobody's just leaving. The euro is strong and getting stronger, which it was. But it meant that uh, Europe had two recessions in five years. Finally, finally, in the middle of 2014, they went to negative rates. In January 2015, they uh, went to quantitative easing, and we got a cheap euro. And so Europe got a lift, actually. Ireland and Spain and some of the other economies, they were doing okay. But who suffers now? What's well, the United States, the U.S. growth. One of the reasons the U.S. growth is so weak is because of the strong dollar. So the point about currency wars is two currencies cannot both devalue against each other at the same time time. It's mathematically impossible. And one of the reasons it's been fairly easy for me to, to explain all this or follow all this is because of that. You know, when everyone was saying, uh, you know, the euro is falling apart, well, it's like, well, there's no way the euro can fall apart unless the dollar gets stronger. And a strong dollar hurts corporate earnings uh, when they because so many of the earnings come in from overseas and slows down the US economy and imports deflation and weakens our economy. So if you want a weak US, sure, go for the go for the uh, cheap euro. It's a never ending pendulum back and forth. It's like a volley across the net, right? Right, exactly. Jim, where can we send people? Thank you for taking some time today. Where can we send people to check your world out? Thank you for that, Mike. I've got a couple of venues. One is my uh, newsletter, uh, Strategic Intelligence, uh, published by Agora Financial. That's easy to find online. Uh, the other place is my Twitter feed, at James G. Rickards. I use my middle initial, James G. Rickards, R-I-C-K-A-R-D-S. I uh, put out a lot of information there. And then, of course, my books, uh, The Death of Money and Currency Wars, both available on Amazon uh, from my publisher, Penguins. Enjoy your day today, sir. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money and up 
down and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.